idea of having foreign governments teaching in American universities is bizarre. The only <laughs> bizarre thing is now the right wing has got a hold of Confucius Institutes because they're in an anti-China, communist, yellow peril, etc. crusade. Hi, I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at academicinfluence.com and Wake Forest University. And it is my pleasure to welcome another guest to this interview show, Professor Marshall Sollins at the University of Chicago. Professor Sollins, we would love to know how you got your start, starting from when you were younger in high school and, and then leading up to today. So tell us a little bit about that story. Well, you know, that we're talking about uh, high school is sort of like uh, the old Stone Age from the from this point of view, it was like, I'm trying to calculate, it's like 70 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> 19, so, 1948, we'll say. Okay. That's uh, 52, yeah, 70 years ago. Wow. And and uh, at that time, you know, not a lot of people were going into anthropology. Not at all. It was uh, a rare field. Uh, in fact, there were very few places that taught it. Uh, what I was interested, in, what got me interested, was I was a consumer of Indian novels, <laughs> you know, about the young tree in the tall pine forest has spoken with a forked tongue. <laughs> that kind. Wow! Of <laughs> so I read a lot of Indian novels, and I began to be interested in other other societies. Wow! And I entered the University of Michigan, 1948. So with a lot of veterans, I mean, a lot of people from World War II. Most of my classmates were older than me. Uh, but I uh, entered, and I remember, I remember registering at the University of Michigan when I first registered, and the, uh, the person who was sort of getting me in said, well, what are you interested in? I said, anthropology. And he said, anthropology? <laughs> You know, I was like in a class of three. Uh, but uh, uh, that was essentially, you know, it's hard to say more deeply why I was interested in other people's. And, uh, and Lady Strauss says you're interested in other people's in order to criticize your own society, which is not a bad point of view. And it might be that it did motivate me because I have been active politically ever since. But uh, that's the story. That's and what the, what did you do after the University of Michigan? Uh, were you were you uh, did you graduate with a major in anthropology? I graduated the major in anthropology. I took a, I did something unusual. The, I was in a class in uh, Near Eastern archaeology, and recruited to go on a field trip uh, to Iran with these. Oh, sorry, to Iraq with these. Uh, Far five other people. Hmm. When they found out that I was Jewish, I was excluded because the Iraqis didn't want to have any Jews coming in. Wow. So I went to Turkey and I did a senior thesis in Turkey on a, on a secret sect uh, of people who believed in a Jewish Messiah of the 18th century. It was my last sort of flirtation with Judaism. I'm not actually a believer. Anyhow, uh, I did that, and then I went to Columbia. I got my, uh, no, for, no, sorry, then I went back. I took a master's at Michigan. Mm -hmm. We had a very tough exam, like 17 hours. Of wow. Fields of anthropology, and for over four days for a mm. master's degree. By the time I got to Columbia, I could ace the doctor exam without any studying. So I did that in a year, and then I did my thesis, and, uh, and then I got a job. I, I had a job at Berkeley when I got my thesis finished. Actually, uh, Alfred Prober, famous anthropologist, secretly interviewed me by it, for a job at Berkeley by inviting me to lunch at the faculty club when I was finishing my thesis. In any case, he, I got a job at Berkeley, and on my way, I was asked to replace Leslie White for a semester at Michigan, and then I was offered a job at Michigan. I reneged at Berkeley. 
and I went to Michigan and taught there for 16 years and I played middle linebacker on the side. <laughs> now that is a good story. Yeah. No, I, I later on I got a I got a uh, I got an honorary degree from Michigan and I addressed the MAs and PhD students who were getting their degrees. I told them about my my career at Michigan, which included the, t- the teaching and many other things. But I said, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm getting a, a, a degree, an honorary degree on the football field of the University of Michigan, because that's where the graduations were. And the thought will go across my mind, just give me the ball, give me the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, when I got home, I had a ball. Was the coach sent the ball, Lloyd Carr, to Dear Marshall, go blue, and I... An autograph football. Oh, that, that is Michigan. really cool. Well, it sounds like you you worked at um, U Michigan for um, many years. Sixteen and, years. And then after those sixteen years, did you go down to the University of Chicago, or did you yeah, go somewhere else? Nineteen seventy three. Okay. Uh, I uh, I moved to Chicago. I was, of course, born in Chicago, raised in Chicago. My family's in Chicago. And aside from Michigan football, the Cubs are my team. So, <laughs> so we moved. Um, we wanted to get back to the city. I mean, oh, good. We Ann Arbor, but uh, we were Chicagoans. Yeah. You and you and your wife were you talking about when you say we? Yes. Okay. And did you have kids who you had to they move back down there? They finished their high school in uh, the university high school in Chicago. Wow. And various went to various colleges. At that point, incidentally, the University of Chicago paid full tuition for all their children of faculty. So, wow, big deal, really good deal. Well, we are we are really glad to hear your life story. Now, what what got you into the specific area of anthropology that you're uh, in now? Well, you know, uh, in Columbia, where I was getting my PhD, there was a great interest in the the development of cultures, evolution of cultures, and especially it came across the desk of one of my teachers, favorite teachers, Morton Fried, since then. Uh, and it came across his desk a certain article about the Aztecs having a certain kind of clan system, which was unusual because it was ranked and so on. It wasn't sort of the equality that you see among most of these, well, most hunters and gatherers and agricultural peoples. And this plant system, which uh, was found by a, a Mexican, a German anthropologist, refugee Mexican, Paul Kircher, he, uh, he labeled it the conical clan, and he said it's an unusual organization. Well, I was working sort of on Polynesia at the time. And I saw that they had the same central clan. So I began to do a, a PhD. I did actually a library thesis on Polynesia. And then I went to the Fiji Islands because it was still functioning. I mean, this is a different planet from what you, from, from the way it is today. For those kids in school and so on, it's hard to recognize what we were doing, what we were doing and what anthropology was doing, essentially, since the late 19th century, was sort of salvaging work, salvaging the cultures that were disappearing. I mean, it was, it was an explicit mission to, you know, write down these things before they disappear. Unfortunately, they all, or not all, but largely disappeared. Uh, and so what I do now, actually, is I, I'm writing a book that trying to revolutionize obsolete anthropology, which is what I do. <laughs> but uh, this, uh, at that time, it wasn't obsolete. So I was interested in actually doing field work in a society that had this kind of clan system, which I did. Wow, that is fascinating. So you would describe yourself as an obsolete anthropologist, yeah. and you're trying to revive that, uh, that I brand. I of- myself that way, but I also think that good anthropology is 40 years out of date. So, we're all- <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions pertaining to uh, the thing you said at the beginning, which is that people go into anthropology to criticize their own culture. And um, you said that that's been a bit true of you because you've gotten into politics uh, to some extent. Uh, and I, I want to follow up on that because we've not only been interviewing your anthropology colleagues, but also professors who are influential in political science. And several of the, the political science professors that I've interviewed sound like they're doing research that's a lot like anthropology. They, they go into uh, cultures that are different. They, they learn about those cultures. They survey them. They, they get to know them. Uh, I'm thinking of one guy in particular, Don Green, has recently spent time in East Africa. He, he's a longtime Yale guy who's now at Columbia. And uh, he, he said it was interesting because people who he surveys there have never been surveyed. So they're not jaded to that kind of, uh, you know, oh, yeah, you know, look, looking at their watch, waiting for the last question that you're going to ask them. Uh, that, that uh, It's a completely different experience, going, like going back in time, he called it. Yeah. So tell us, tell us both a little bit about your political uh, forays and also about how you see this sort of going back in time and, and why did that appeal to you when you were um, getting your start in anthropology? There's always a sense of going back in time, but it's not really kosher to talk about these people as being of another time. Ah, you know, okay. Uh, Sorry about that. I'm, I, I don't know these kinds of things. Sorry. Do it, but they do survey. We, survey is not what we did. Uh, what we did was you sat there until you could understand something going on, <laughs> and you tried to talk about what was going on, and it took a very long time before you even started to do an understanding of these societies, which, which even after a year or two what would be very superficial. So were you, were you, sorry to interrupt, but were you in these cultures for a year or two? Yeah, yeah, and on the Fiji Islands. My wife and I were on an island about 90 miles from the main island, which got two small, two or three small cargo ships of supplies from the main island a year. Whoa. So, you know, we ran out of coffee, ran out of cigarettes, ran out of <laughs> that was cigarettes. We were smoked at the time, of course. Uh-huh. And here well, you are now. We were, we, we were, we were marooned. And oh, wow. There was a radio telegraph that broke down. But, I mean, yeah, it was, uh, it was far away. Wow. And, and you were there for we, two years? I mean, we, the chief gave us a post. And we lived there for a year. So. Oh, a whole year. Wow. And, and so the difference between what I was describing for some of these political scientists and you is that you really became part of the culture even as you, you were know, studying the culture. Anthropologists, if they go to an, a place like that, which most of them do, you have to just uh, consider it's going to take a long time to understand what's going on. You have to learn the language. Uh, I, incidentally, I had it very funny that at six o'clock tonight I get on a Zoom to Fiji because there's a big conference about some chief being some some uh, controversy over the succession to a chief, uh, and somehow uh, there's a university at Fiji. Somehow, three or four of the faculty got involved in this controversy. One of them is actually a member of the controversy. And we're going to have this big Zoom about chiefly succession of the Fiji Islands at six o'clock. Oh, and, and, and some of which is in Fiji. Uh, anyhow, uh, yes, uh, anthropology fieldwork is serious, long-term investment because understanding another society is not something like doing survey work where you have an interpreter probably. Uh, telling you the answers. Uh, <clears throat> this is something else. I see. As far as politics is concerned, yes. Uh, uh, I've been involved. I think the other day I said I, I successfully was involved in three struggles. First, I stopped the war in Vietnam by inventing the teach-in in 1965 uh, when a bunch of us were going to go on strike against the university and to hold classes outside about Vietnam. And 
the university came and the state came down on our heads. And there were a lot of people who didn't have tenure involved. I did. And so we got worried about that, that, that kind of action. And instead, we're sitting around one night, I said, well, instead of teaching out, why don't they teach in? We'll have a teach in. <laughs> And uh, that was pretty brilliant. Now we hear about that all the time. <laughs> so that was it. If I had a nickel for everything that's been called a teaching since, including a, including a band in Belgium or in Belgium or someplace that won the European Song Contest, contest called the teaching, <laughs> the band. <laughs> if I had a nickel for all those teachings, I'd be rich. But anyhow, it's now even a. Even even uh, corporations used the term when and before it was a protest term, of course. Oh, wow. Anyhow, it became a national movement between March and May 1965. We had a national teaching that was broadcast all day on NPR and, and several foreign uh, television networks and a radio hookup of 200 colleges. And we had a big teaching. Uh, of course, it didn't stop the war, but it was the beginning of the protest uh, that went on for years, of course. So that was one thing. And I also uh, saved a park in Ann Arbor and got rid of a bad president of the University of Chicago. Those were my three famous political activities. <laughs> I, 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 four. I, also, I also brought down the Confucius Institute at the University of Chicago. Oh, was it uh, more of a cult than an institute? This is due to his academic malware propagated and propagandized by the People's Republic of China, which sends teachers here that get oh. to be in their regular curricula of uh, universities teaching Chinese, and they're vetted for their political uh, beliefs and uh, what they teach. And uh, the institute itself is all a glorified view of China. Mm -hmm. And the idea of having foreign governments teaching in American universities is bizarre. The only <laughs> bizarre thing is now the right wing has got a hold of Confucius Institutes because they're in an anti-China, communist, yellow peril, etc. crusade. And the government now is interfering in American universities to get rid of Confucius Institutes. Ten years ago, American professors had the chance of getting rid of them, but they sat on their hands, even though it was a clear violation of the integrity of the university. Now the government sends. So instead of, I mean, we are in a lose-lose situation where either the Chinese or the American government interferes in the American university, which I think is a bad, bad thing to do. Yeah. It sounds like you've been really uh, for autonomy of the university, whether it's the war in, in Vietnam, uh, you know, which, which you were against and might, might make you a friend of, of the communists because you were trying to keep the U.S. from, from fighting the communists in, in Vietnam. And on the other hand, you're against the communists as they try to infiltrate our university. So you, you're, you're neither, neither friend of either side. <laughs> oh, I'm, friend, but that's, I'm a friend of the people. <laughs> that's right. I was going to say, and that's because you you're know, a friend. The other day, Kamala Harris... It said something that impressed me. She said when she was first up an assistant to DA and she was doing a case and she was taking charge of the case and and the judge and uh, and she identified herself as Kamala Harris for the people. <laughs> she was she was advocating for the people. Well good for I her. Feel that, I feel that way. Uh, we, we, we need more people who are politically involved, who are for the people, just like you, Professor Solins. Um, now, as, as we close out our interview, um, are there things that you didn't get to say in the, um, the interview that you did on YouTube that you mentioned before we started this interview um, and, and that you'd like to say? No, but so, I, would, I would like to highlight something if you're going to, if, if students are going to link to that. And that is, it, there's a section in that interview that tells you essentially what anthropology is and why anthropology in some ways has an even better chance of truth than physics because truth is human and so are you. <laughs> and, 
you're studying the same thing as you are. Yes, There's no, no disagreement from me. I, well, yeah, I, physics, yeah. the more you know, the more bizarre it is, right? I mean, quantum yeah. mechanics. Oh, gosh, yeah, I, I, I stay away from that side of physics. I, I study things that are, are easily observable in the microscope. Well, anthropology, oh. the, the more you get into the culture, the more it's logical. But logic is something that's going on inside you. And you that's right. the same nature as the thing you're studying. Mm -hmm. It means that you have a chance of truth that is a certain kind of truth, a meaningful truth that um, you can't get in other sciences. So there's mm -hmm. that section in the interview which I recommend to students if you want to know what I think anthropology is, what it is fundamentally. Wonderful. And we will link from this interview to that interview as well so that people can see the full picture of I Professor Marshall Sollins. <laughs> I think it's called Anthropology 101 or, or Chicago Humanities or something. If you can't find it, I'll send it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor Sollins. It has truly been a delight to spend this time with you. We, uh, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day, and we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you.